What makes a piece of music great? You, you will know a great piece of music because it's irresistible. I don't care what genre it's in. I don't care whether it's country and western. I don't care whether it's symphonic music. I don't care whether it's anything. It has the ability to reach into the human consciousness, whether you want it to or not, and grab you. It's that powerful. In fact, uh, Manfred Kleins uh, did uh, some cross-cultural studies of the impact of music on the human psyche. Mm-hmm. And he identified about eight sine wave patterns that correspond to, it's a two-second sine wave pattern that corresponds to an emotion. Mm-hmm. This pattern gives you anger. This pattern gives you love. This pattern gives you hate. This pattern gives you joy. And it's consistent throughout Indian music, Australian, Aborigine music, African music, European music, America. It's consistent. That sine wave pattern will elicit that emotion. That's powerful stuff. So, no, so as long as this particular uh, a sine wave would be uh, uh, w- what's happening, if someone were to take a microphone and hook it up to an oscilloscope or right, something, exactly. they would create waves, and you could mm. see the waves. And you could see the waves. If, if, a, if a composer hits this particular pattern, mm-hmm. it will elicit the same emotion, it regardless of what the rest of the song is doing. It will do it. Let me tell you two examples. That, uh, you know, when you experience this, it's amazing. And one of the most perfect presentations of music that I've experienced is a Las Vegas show. Mm-hmm. And I had an opportunity to play dozens and dozens of Las Vegas shows. I played about 40 shows with Liberace at Heinz Hall back in the 70s. And he had a point in his show, because those shows are engineered to do certain things because they have to get that reaction in order to keep people coming. Uh, he had a certain point in the first part of his show where he would talk about his favorite composer was Chopin. And he would play a little Chopin uh, melody. uh, And the lighting director would turn the lights around the grand tier up on the rheostat and back down again. And a tear would fall out of my eyes every time it happened. I said, holy smoke, what are they doing? You know, it never failed. It happened every time. Hmm. That makes you sit back and say, whoa, (laughs) there's something going on here. Um, I played other shows that have those moments. The guys who write those shows know something. Uh, when a great artist takes their bow, they call it bows on the music, you know, it's usually their theme song, right? So uh, Liberace's theme song was I'll Be Seeing You. And they write that arrangement in a certain way that your hair just raises on you as they take their bow. It's an incredible experience. Uh, uh, Thanks for the Memories was... Uh, um, uh, Bob Hopes, I think, yeah, yeah. and and you, you just get that, and you just oh my God, Lena Horns it was stormy weather, you know, and and it just grabs you and it brings it back. So I use that in my performances, and I use that when I write a score for a play or for a movie or something like that, because that's what people are coming for. They're coming for an experience, and those experiences literally affect your direct directly affect your physiology. They enable your body to produce endorphins. That's what we're all after. When they talk, the kids talk about the juice, they're after endorphins. Endorphins are what people take drugs to get. Our mm-hmm. body makes the drugs. Hmm. And you can get high on these intellectual and artistic and cultural experiences. You can get high on a new idea. Learning can make you high. I have a series of high school lectures I do about getting high on learning. And anytime you get into any subject like that, it'll do that. Another experience of that power is uh, once about 25 years ago, I was playing a park concert in East Liberty and I played a blues. I always try to play a blues because the blues is the roots of the music that came from Africa. So uh, I played a blues and I noticed at the corner of my eye that there was a man in a stupor over in the bushes near a telephone booth. As Soon as we started the blues, he woke up and he looked at the band and he got up and he came over to the band. He started dancing in front of the band. The stage was about this high. Mm-hmm. He tried to climb up on the stage and join the band. I said, <laughs> look at this. It's like, it's like a snake charmer. You know, we're playing this blues. And we woke up this man who was almost de- consciously dead. So I said, and as soon as we finished playing the blues, he disappeared back into oblivion. I couldn't even find him. I don't know where he went. So I said, hmm, that's very interesting. So ever since then, every time I play in public, I look for a person like that, especially when I'm outside, and I purposely play a blues to see what happens, and it never fails. Never fails. Hmm. I did, I I wrote a piece um, 
I performed, uh, I haven't been performing under my own name for quite a few years, but I put a band together, a combo together, and performed for the Pittsburgh Jazz Society on January 2nd. And I pulled out a song that I wrote in 1983 as a, a, a funeral dirge for musicians. I call it Dambala Mobute, which Dambala is the spirit of the drum, you know, that um, represents itself in a, in a snake, and, and it represents that, it's a, it's a Yorba term. Anyway, um, I said to the audience before I started, I said, now you guys know I'm a psychologist. I said, I'm getting ready to make you cry. <laughs> So I said, this is a piece I wrote, and just sit back and experience it. And I turned to the musicians, and they started just playing my chords, because I knew I wrote those chords that have those sine wave patterns in it that do certain things, and I knew I was gonna pull that at your solar plexus. They started to play the chords, and I had received a list on the internet of all the jazz musicians that died in 1999. There were about 65 names on it. I just read the names. And I knew that each time I read a name, somebody would have a memory of something in some circumstance that would, you know, bring that person back to them for a moment and have that person literally visit them in their consciousness at the time. And I read all 65 names. And when I got to the last one, which was Curtis Mayfield, um, I timed it just so that I would be at the end of the course and then I would start the melody. And I started the melody, and then we played one chorus of the melody and finished, and it wasn't a dry eye in the place, including mine. <laughs> okay.